right, let's get started, I guess. Uh, this is a very big day for Sergio and a really big day for me. Uh, this is certainly one of the top five doctoral students that I've ever had. And I've graduated 17 now. Uh, but And another one's in the room. <laughs> and he forced me to put him on the committee. So, now, the truth is, is that Sergio has been everything that you would want a student to be in terms of his performance, uh, not only as a researcher, but also as an outstanding instructor at UCA. He came to us from Columbia. Sergio got a bachelor's degree in marine biology, interestingly enough, from the Jorge Tadeo Lozano University, graduating in 2007. Um, he co-founded an NGO called ProCap in Colombia and actually worked there for seven years. But while he was doing that, he was also doing publishable research. Um, besides his dissertation and earning the PhD, he also has a graduate certificate in geographic information science and technology from geosciences. So he's going to be able to really continue on with the level of, of research that we have come to expect from him. Um, he's published one book, three book chapters, and 23 peer-reviewed papers, including nine since he's been at Texas Tech, and we have three more that have been submitted, and at least two of them have been accepted. Uh, and so we're just waiting for them to uh, complete the publication process. He got a scholarship from Columbia for his doctoral work, and this past year at Texas Tech, he earned the Horn Professor Graduate Distinguished Research Award. Um, I only have had one other student that got that, and that was Miriam Vanegas, and um, we all know about Miriam. <clears throat> He's mentored 13 undergraduates uh, in terms of their uh, undergraduate thesis when he was working with Miriam and with the rest of our research group down in Panama in, in some of the work that you're going to be hearing about today. And perhaps most interesting, he is the regional vice chair for Latin America and the Caribbean IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and um, Species Survival group for uh, crocodilians. And so he is essentially a major player for IUCN and, S and uh, the Crocodilian Specialist Group and, and literally has been to several international meetings that they have paid for him to go to simply to uh, put forth his ideas on conservation and biology. Um, I don't know what else I can say. Um, it's been a pleasure having him in the lab. I certainly hope that we will continue to collaborate for many years, uh, as long as I'm still walking. Uh, his dissertation committee, Dr. Nancy McIntyre, Dr. David Ray, Dr. Richard Stevens, and on the phone is Dr. Rich Strauss. Um, I really don't know what else to say. I think what we'll do is turn it over. What he's going to do, oh, I'm sorry. Jerry Clifford-Kyle is the graduate representative today, and we really appreciate her presence. Um, as I said, I'm going to turn it over to him. He's going to talk about a number of the chapters in his dissertation, which essentially have all been published. Um, but what we're going to do is uh, try and keep it to 35 minutes. So, That's right. <laughs> without further ado, Sergio. Thank you, Liz. So, 
thank you everyone for coming. Good afternoon. So the title of my project was The Natural History of the American Crocodile in a Tropical Pacific Island in Panama, Central America. So the American Crocodile is a widespread crocodilian that range from Florida in the United States to Venezuela on the Atlantic Caribbean coast and from Mexico to northern Peru on the Pacific coast from zero to 500 meters above the sea level. This species is currently cataloged as vulnerable by the IUCN red list and it's part of the Appendix 1 of CITES. Comprehensive knowledge regarding the, American his the, the life history of the American crocodile can be found in Florida and in Mexico and in a lesser extent in Colombia and Venezuela. So based on this um, background, I wanted to investigate whether the American crocodile life history differs in terms of main ecological attributes across its range. However, to answer this question, I need first to understand whether these ecological attributes differ from between insular and mainland population and between coastal and inland population. Therefore, the main objective of my project was to investigate the natural history of the American crocodile on Coiva Island, addressing a comprehensive ecological framework regarding four specific topics. Reproductive ecology, population ecology, spatial ecology, and trophic ecology. The study area was placed in the southern tip of Coiva, there, I followed these four transects from January to December 2013, uh, evaluating all these uh, four main ecological attributes. I also collect information and use information in the case of chapter um, five, the spatial ecology, data that was collected between two, two, 2010 and 2011. So Coiva Island uh, was a prison for almost a century, highly impacting all the coastal habitats. However, since 2004, a natural recovery has been seen on this area. <coughs> the study area encompassed four main types of habitats, mangroves, beaches, riparian forests, and rainforests. Non-reproductive, non neither traffic studies has been done in Coiva before, however, some preliminary population and spatial analysis had been done in the area before the present study. So regarding the, the reproductive ecology of this species, I assess a total of 50 variables from January to December 2013. However, because time constraint, today I will just talk about four of these. Clutch size, hatching success, minimum reproductive size of females, and hatching growth rate and survivorship. So I found a total of 10 nests, eight in Playa Blanca that is placed in the southern tip of the study area, and two in El Maria that is placed in the northern tip of the study area. The clutch size was on average 25 eggs, and the hatching success was around 89%. However, 68% of these eggs hatched by themselves or with mother's help, and around 20% egg of these eggs hatched with human help. So comparing this with other places, the mean clutch size in Coiva Island was in line with what has been reported in other insular places such as Banco Chinchorro Island in Mexico, Forte Island in Colombia, Turnefi Atoll in Belize, and Haiti. In contrast, the mean clutch size that I found in Coiba Island was significantly different with what has been reported in other uh, mainland places, such Florida, Panama, and Colombia. The total length of mothers was 219 centimeters, and analyzing the minimum reproductive size, I found that the Values that I got in Coiba Island were highly related with what has been reported in other insular areas. However, in this case, it was not that clear that difference between mainland population and insular population. Nevertheless, Coiba Island and these other two small islands were re highly um, related regarding the minimum reproductive size. 
So hatchlings hatched in April with on average total length around 25 centimeters, reaching 50 centimeters by December. The hatching growth didn't follow a linear tendency. However, the Gumpers nonlinear model was the one that best described the hatchling growth um, on this period. The hatchling growth rate did neither follow a linear nor a nonlinear uh, tendency, as we can see in the graph, having the highest uh, growth rate in the first month of um, after hatching and with an average of 0.1 centimeters per day. Only one study has studied this, has evaluated this variable before that was in Haiti after two months of uh, animals hatched, and that value was higher, sorry, that value was higher compared with what I obtained in Coiva. I also estimate the hatchling survivorship using the Popan formulation to estimate the initial hatchling population, and the value that I got was 218 hatchlings in the area, in the study area. So based on that, I estimate that 65% of all these hatchlings die between May and June, and 95% between May and July. Only 0.5% of this population survive through December. So this shows the low rate recruitment that this place has, this population has. I invite you to check the paper that derived from this chapter that is already available so you can see more in detail all these analysis and results. So regarding the population ecology of the species, I perform a natural experiment in order to determine the population size in the area based on indirect methods, spotlight surveys, and direct methods, more recapture. So to do that, I set up I set up two teams, the spotlight team and the capture team, and they follow these transects from February to December 2014. Before that, I did a pre-sampling in order to determine the holding time required after the highest type to survey these transects so we can walk through them and we can spot the maximum number of American crocodiles with no interference between teams. So after this uh, pre-sampling, I define a, a two hours holding time to start a surviving transects and a time in between teams of 30 minutes. So avoiding interference between the counting of the spotlight surveys and the counting in, from, from the capture team. The spotlight team is to estimate the size of animals, grouping them by size classes, and the capture team estimate, measure the total length of all animals and group them by age groups. So with the um, spotlight survey data, I estimate the sacting fraction based on two equations, meso and king. This symbol represents the mean of observation per survey. Max is the maximum number of, of, of observations by size class, and SD is the standard deviation of the mean. Both of these uh, authors use this equation to estimate the population size with a um, 95% confidence interval assuming that data is normal. For this analysis, I also develop a new equation that I call sighting fraction based on sampling distribution. And in this case, SE is the standard error of the sampling distribution and N is the sampling size. I estimate the sampling distribution bootstrapping the spotlight data 100,000 times. In the case of the MAR recapture, I use again the Popan formulation testing four models. Full time dependence, no time dependence, either no sex determined and hatchlings allowed to vary, and either males, not sex determined, juveniles, and hatchlings allowed to vary. So, I collect, in the case of the spotlight survey, survey data, I collect a lot of information, but for the purpose of this presentation, let's just pay attention to the population size that we estimate by meso, that in this case was 19 individuals, king equation that was 25 individuals, and my equation that was 217 individuals. In the case of the MAR recapture data, again, I estimate a lot of variables, 
But let's just pay attention to the initial population by sex and by age group. So by sex, I obtain a minimum popula uh, uh, initial population of 145 individuals and by age group, 232 individuals. So how can we know which of these methods better estimate um, these attributes? So, well, I estimate the minimum population size in the area between all using all captures between 2009 and 2013. So I estimate that for uh, 2013, we had a minimum population size of 112 non-hatchlings individuals. Now, if we compare this value with the values that we got from those estimations, Mesut and King, we can see that they highly underestimate um, the population size. In contrast, if we compare this minimum population size with my equation, we can see that first the value is over, which in this case is good, and also is highly related with what we obtain using the direct method, the MAR recapture method, and supposedly that is the best way to estimate the population size. So it looks promising the use of this new equation to make estimation of population size based on indirect data. Remember that the, these set, this estimation and this estimation were from, are coming from two completely separate sets of, sets of data. I invite you to check the paper that comes, that derived from this uh, chapter that will be soon published so you can see more in detail all the analysis and results. So based on all animals captured in this study, I also wanted to investigate whether the dorsal scutulation of, the, of, of, of American crocodiles is variable enough to allow individual identification. Some authors have pointed out already that American crocodiles have a really irregular, high irregular pattern on the dorsal area, but no one until now has tested or used it as an individual identification tool let's say like a fingerprint. So in this case, I just took dorsal photographs of, of all individuals captured in the area and processed them counting the skews transversally and horizontally. With this data, I develop a new method that I call it a individual identification pattern recognition. So this method is basically in two types of analysis the binary analysis in which all transversal skewed lines are classified based on presence or absence. So you can see here one, present, zero, absent. And the coded analysis in which I classify all transversal skewed lines also including the position, if that was on the left side or on the right side, in order to determine the probability of presence. So with all this data, I estimate the likelihood of finding two individuals with the same skewed pattern and the necessary numbers of transversal skewed lines needed for it. I call that the minimum probability, the minimum number of individuals need, needed to repeat a pattern. So I process a total of 110 individuals and based on the binary analysis, I got seven possible combinations, seven possible patterns on the postoccipital, nuchal, and dorsal area. As we can see here in this part, in this slide, line number five, number four, and number five, and number 21 are highly variable, is bringing a lot of variation to the analysis, as well as the middle section of the dorsal area. Evaluating the representativeness of these patterns on the body, we could see that even though here we are analyzing the number of patterns, we see that the middle section of the dorsal area brings a lot of variation, has a lot of patterns on that area. And also line four and line 21 brings variation to the analysis because they are not always present. So they bring more variation to the analysis. I found analyzing all the skews, I found that they are all significantly different and lines three, four, five, and 21 are the most that are, are the ones that bring more variation to the analysis. So using the binary analysis, I could classify all the individuals using only the first 13 transversal skewed lines, estimating a minimum probability of 2.02 times 10 at minus fifth. 
This, this means that only one American crocodile in a group of 49,504 individuals will have the same number of skewed pat patterns per transversal skewed line, comparing with the reference individual. And using the most likely pattern that I found in the, in the study using the binary analysis, the minimum probability is 2.88 times 10 at minus six, meaning that only one American crocodile in a group of 347,222 individuals will have an identical skewed number. So it's a lot. In the case of the coded analysis, I found, I identified 23 patterns, possible patterns, and, oh, sorry. And as we can see here, even though the number of patterns increase on the, on the, on all transversal skewed lines, we can see that the middle section of the dorsal area is the one that is bringing the most, uh, the highest variation to the analysis. The maximum number of patterns that I could identify in a skewed line was 16 on line six and seven. So based on this analysis, we can see that it's bringing more variation. So based on this analysis, I could identify all individuals using just the first 10 transversal skewed lines. We are talking from anterior to posterior direction. And the minimal probability here was 0 0.003. This means that only one American crocodile out of 3,333 will have the same skewed pattern as the reference individual. And if we use all the, the most likely pattern that I found in this, in this study using the coded analysis, the minimum probability is 6.98 times 10 at the minus eight. This means that only one American crocodile in a group of 14,326,647 individuals will have the same and same identical skewed pattern. So if we just put this number in perspective, we know that we can, if, if, if these apply to all the range, this distribution range of these species, we could identify all individuals. We now need to analyze the variation in other populations to see if these will increase or decrease, but just based on these numbers, we could identify all of them. So we can use that as a finger point. It's highly variable. So I invite you guys to check the, the paper that is already available so you can see more in detail all the, the analysis and results. In the case of the spatial ecology analysis, I captured, tagged, released, and followed a total of 24 American crocodiles, 21 from February to December 2013, and three coming from data collected between 2010 and 2011. So in this case, I use a model to estimate the final position of each individual, and I base it on the geolocation of each station, the azimuth that I collect in field, and a standard distance. I also estimate the error of each fix in order to estimate the uncertainty of the whole data. And with that, with all this data, I estimate the home range and initialization distribution of the species, the average moving distance, the conspecific proximity, and the site fidelity. So again, in this case, I collect a lot of information, but let's just pay attention to the A and B column. So a sub-adult had the maximum A and D average moving distance that was around 1.1 kilometers. But we can see that the maximum moving distance was done by an adult and was around 5.6 kilometers. And the minimum AMD was, in, was obtained in a group of sub-adults and was 35, 81, and 91 meters. So using this, I estimate the uncertainty value of all these geolocations. And we can see that was 38 plus minus 54, was really high. However, if we check the data, we can see that 60% of the location had an uncertainty low than 26 meters, and 9%, less than 9% of the data had values over 100. So if we just take off these outliers, 
we will see that the average, the uncertainty average of these fixes drops to 24 plus minus 23. So now put this in perspective. If we compare these numbers with the numbers that I just showed in the previous slide, we can see that in this case, the uncertainty value is higher than the minimum AMD, right? But if we take off all these um, outliers, that value drops below the minimum AMD. So this shows that it's completely necessary filter the data and estimate the error of fixes because depending on how you are collecting that, you can have a lot of error. However, in, in general, in telemetry studies all around, this part is neglected. People don't estimate the error of fixes, which is really bad. And if you are translating this to habitat use, just think that you are moving from meters to square meters. So you are increasing the error and you are bringing an error, a huge error to your habitat use analysis. So that's why this is really important. <coughs> so relating the precipitation values that I got in 2000, 2013 in the area with the average moving distance, we can see a pattern here that the average moving distance varies through the year and between years, which was significantly different. This pattern was also clear when we analyzed that by sex, with females moving larger distance than males. This pattern could be seen over here by age group, but was not statistically significant, the difference. I found significantly dif difference though, comparing A and D with precipitation seasons, so rainy season and dry season, and A and D with reproductive behavior, comparing by nesting, brooding, hatching, and courtship, and mating times. The conspecific analysis showed that adults are hatchlings are highly related with adults which makes sense at the time that they are close in the, in the nursery area. So the first month, hatchlings are close to mothers. So that, that makes sense. Juveniles are more related with hatchlings, which makes sense also because the nursery areas in crocodilians, in American crocodiles in general, last just one month. After that, mother left and they are on their own. So they start moving around and being more related with the other juveniles. Adults more related with sub-adults and juveniles, interestingly enough, juveniles were never close up to 200 meters to adults, likely to avoid cannibalism. So even though females had larger, um, moved larger distance, males had larger home ranges and utilization distribution areas. So moving larger areas doesn't mean that they have larger home ranges in this case. Sub-adults, in the case of age groups, sub-adults had the largest home ranges comparing with juveniles, adults, and hatchlings. I found site fidelity based on both indices that I used to test it in the majority of animals. However, one animal did not exhibit this behavior, and nine animals provide inconclusive results. I invite you guys to check this paper that is already available, but derived from this chapter, so you can see more in detail all the analysis and results. Finally, talking about the trophic ecology of the species, I collect, I capture 49 individuals, collect all the stomach contents, and identified them until it was impossible to go further. Using this data, I estimate the ontogenetic dietary partitioning, the dietary niche breadth and degree of dietary specialization, and the dietary niche overlap. So I found a total of four main items inside of the stomach content. I found gastrolytes, parasites, prey items, and vegetal components. And as we can see, the most important was prey items, followed by gastrolytes, vegetal component, and parasites. So putting this in, in perspective, so proportionally, large juveniles had more, the largest amount of prey items followed by small juveniles and adults. 
adults had the largest amount of gastrolytes, followed by large juveniles. Sub-adults had the largest amount of vegetal components, followed by sub uh, small juveniles, and small juveniles had the largest amount of parasites. I identified three phyla, four sub phyla, eight classes, eleven order, seventeen families, fourteen genera, and twelve species. And I grouped them in a seven major uh, prey items component. That was insects, arachnids, crustaceans, fish, reptiles, bird, birds, and mammals. So based on these seven major prey items, I, we can see over here that crustaceans were the most important all across age groups, followed by insects. The diversity analysis show lower values. However, we can see here a pattern. Small juveniles and large juveniles are more generalist, and subadults and adults are more specialist. If we analyze all the species that we that I identify uh, through time, we can see that crustaceans were really important, and they were all the year through the year, comparing with the older species, showing how relevant crustaceans were for American crocodiles in this area. The dietary niche overlap analysis show a clear ontogenetic partitioning, niche partitioning on the area, with large juveniles and small juveniles overlapping a lot, and sub-adults and adults comparing with a small juvenile having a less overlap. Finally, the overlapping group analysis shows how important were crustaceans, so green is crustaceans, all over the sizes, the range of sizes that, with respect to the animals that we captured, and in a lesser extent, insects. Here we can see that arachnids were only present in juveniles, and that is really interesting. It's because where they live at the time they are in the nursery areas, but after that, it's not arachnids anymore. So that's really interesting. And also, vertebrates were not really important, an important component in the diet, which, which was a little bit surprising. But we can see a pattern here that as animals increase in size the number of vertebrates or, or the species uh, um, belonging to this group just increased. I invite you to check the paper that is um, derived from this chapter so you can see more in detail all the analysis and results. It's close to be published. So we, I can conclude from this um, dissertation that um, the American crocodile life history including all the main variables that I analyzed, varies considerably from insular to mainland populations and, be between, and from coastal to inland populations. And this is presumably due to a more limited amount of resources on insular and coastal areas, as we could expect, showing how flexible American crocodile is in terms of, of habitat requirements. The population number that we found that I found in Koiba Island, as well as the demographic structure that I couldn't explain here because time, um, suggests a well-established population, similar to what has been described in other um, all across this range. However, the data suggests that the realized niche on insular populations shrink compared with mainland populations, seemingly due to a reduce of availability of resources and an inherent increase of intra and interspecific competition. The tropic and spatial ecology data collected in the present study and from other coastal uh, habitats demonstrate that American crocodile intraspecific variation occurs mainly because niche partitioning, as we could see, with low levels of reciprocal overlap by age groups, maybe because hierarchization. This has a potential to relax the intensity of intraspecific competition in the area. So niche breadth also reinforces the idea of low levels of intraspecific variation in coastal uh, competition on in coastal crocodile populations because we saw that young animals were more generalist 
and older animals were more specialists. So it's likely a trade-off among resources of availability, intraspecific competition, uh, niche partitioning, and the America crocodile life history plasticity that play a crucial role to structure the populations and the viability over time. So even though American crocodile all the time is described it, describe it as a top predator and fit upon a different group of carnivores, we saw in this analysis and in other coastal analysis that um, American crocodiles relies mainly upon abundant, easy to catch prey, such crustaceans, rather than larger prey. This, this was really interesting and has important implications when we think about the role of the species inside of the community or ecosystem of what the species belongs to, bringing more complexity than we previously thought. So this tropic plasticity also provides American crocodiles an excellent, an excellent adaptability to changing tropic conditions. And that could be one of the reasons why this species is widespread all over the Americas. So future research should be focused, or my future research will be focused on the roles of American crocodiles as functional and structural part of the ecosystem and the community where the, where the species belong. And I think that that will provide a lot of answers to all the many of questions that this dissertation just rise to me. Answering questions related with ontogenetic labor variation, carrying capacity of the system regarding a, regarding age groups that I think of this is a really core part, like how, how the system can support hatchlings different to juveniles, different to older crocodilians. That, I think that's pretty neat. And I think that is a part that no one has worked on and has a lot of potential. And we'll, we'll provide a lot of insightful information critical for understanding American crocodile population as a functional and a structural part of ecosystems. And finally, I will just continue uh, testing the methods that I developed in this dissertation, the sampling distribution equation to estimate population size based on indirect data, and the identi individual identification uh, pattern recognition method to ID crocodilians. Both of them proved to be uh, being effective and robust under COIBA conditions. So I need to start testing these methods in other areas and, in, and with other species. Finally, I want to thank all people that were involved in this project and helped me to collect these tons of data, which was a lot of information. My advisor, Lou Densmore, my committee members, Nancy McIntyre, uh, Richard Strauss, that is now in the phone, uh, David Ray and Richard Stevens, uh, the PA of the project, Miriam Venegas, and the army of undergrad students that I had under my command in, in COIBA collecting all the data. You can't imagine how much data we collect over there. It was a lot, tons of information. So, and, and I couldn't do it without them. So I want to thank them. And also, I want to thank Densmore Lab, the past Densmore Lab and the new Densmore Lab because they are support. They, they will help me a lot. And lastly, I want to thank to all the institutions that support this project logis logistically or um, uh, economically. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.